The only pressure units that you'll have to deal with are atmospheres and millimeters of mercury. The other units on there, I don't really care about. There's lots of different pressure units. Um, a lot of people in the industry work with pounds per square inch, and we could you know, spend a whole day just converting between all those units, so we don't really have the time to do that. But the millimeters of mercury is relevant because that relates directly to how barometers are designed. So we said that you know, we have this tube of mercury open to the atmosphere, and when the atmosphere, the molecules in the atmosphere are moving around, they collide with the surface of that mercury, it forces up the tube. So the distance up the tube that the mercury is forced is measured in mil millimeters, and that tells you the pressure of the atmosphere. So that's an important uh, conceptually understandable unit for pressure. And then the atmosphere is just very convenient, and a lot of the calculations in the textbook use atmosphere, so that's probably even more common. So if you're given information in atmospheres, you need to be able to convert it to millimeters of mercury and vice versa. And so the relationship is one atmosphere equals 760 millimeters of mercury. And so if you have a barometer at sea level at normal atmospheric pressure and that gas in the atmosphere is hitting down on that pool of mercury, it should force the mercury up the tube 760 millimeters, which is um, about 30 inches or so. So that's that relationship. So we can use that to do any conversion. So the one in that question says if you have 375 millimeters of mercury, how many atmospheres is that? So like any of our conversions, if we had a quantity measuring a certain amount, but it's not in the unit we want, we need the relationship between those units to convert that quantity by multiplying it by a factor that's equal to one. So we're not changing the amount, just changing the units. So here I want the millimeters of mercury to cancel, and I want to get ATM. So I'll employ this relationship. Anytime two things are equal, I can put either one of them on top and the other on the bottom. In this case, I want the millimeters of mercury on the bottom because that's the unit I'm trying to cancel and that is equal to one atmosphere. So then I would just plug that in to my calculator and I get 0.493. So we're not going to deal with bars and tours and pascals, you know, really on, on the exam at all. But if you wanted to convert to any of those other units, you'd use, you'd use the same method. You'd have to Google or look up what the relationship is between millimeters of mercury and tour, or between millimeters of mercury and pascal, and then just use that relationship as a conversion to convert the units. Other questions? So in 11.41, that relates to the density of a gas. Normally, when we measure density, like we did in the first lab experiment, in the second lab experiment, we we're trying to identify these substances, so we measured their density to try to match that up with known densities for varieties of liquids. 
For a liquid, usually we measure the density in grams per milliliter. And that's a convenient unit because you just measure out a couple milliliters in the graduated cylinder, put it on the balance, you read how many grams it is, you take the grams, divide it by the milliliters, and you have the density. What we said about a liquid, though, is that in the liquid state, and this also goes for the solid state, the particles, whatever they are, the molecules, are going to have either some polarity, where they would have a dipole with opposite charges on opposite ends, or at the very least, they'll be polarizable, which means even if they're nonpolar and they don't have opposite charges on opposite ends, they have electrons in their orbitals and their electrons are fluid and they can shift around. So even then, if I don't normally have a charge, the electrons will shift to create partial charges on opposite sides. And so in the liquid state, the molecules are moving slow enough. Translationally, they're not flying through space so fast. So those opposite charges pull them together. And so they pack together closely in order to maximize those attractions. And the amount of space between them is very minimal. Whether they're atoms or molecules or ions, those charges are going to help them come together. So if the molecules are close together and there's not much space between them, then if I'm measuring how much matter is in a given amount of space, it's going to be higher. I have a high density because I can fit a lot of actual matter, which is the protons and neutrons mainly, because they have much more mass than electrons. I can fit a lot more of that into a given amount of space because they're packed closely together and they don't have empty space between them. So, <clears throat> let's say this is one milliliter, right? So I, I, met, I take a milliliter of my sample. <clears throat> That'd be the most convenient amount because then I would just figure out how many grams that is, measure the mass on the balance, divide by one milliliter, and that would give me the the density in grams per milliliter. With the gas though, because in a gas, my particles are s much more spread out, whatever they are, they might still be polar or they might be nonpolar but capable of shifting fluid electrons. Either way, if it is in the gas state, there's going to be a lot of empty space. Most of the space is emptiness. The actual amount of space occupied by the particles compared to the amount of empty space, the space com occupied by the particles is so small, it's a fraction, it's a small fraction, less than 1% of the actual space. And the reason for that is because the particles are moving around fast enough where if they did bump into to one another, which they do a lot because they're moving so fast, they have so much speed that the intermolecular attractions, the dipole, dipole, London forces and such, are not strong enough to hold them together like in a liquid. And so they just bounce off and they keep bouncing around in, within that space. So here, <coughs> instead of measuring the density in grams per milliliter, because mostly empty space and there's not much matter in a milliliter, you usually see it measured in grams per liter instead. A liter is a thousand times larger than a milliliter. So if a milliliter is a small amount of space in a liquid, I can still put a lot of mass in there because it's all packed in densely together. But in a gas, it's mostly empty space, so I need more space. I need like a thousand times more space to get a number for density that's not a tiny fraction, that's hard to think about mathematically, right? It's much, much easier to think about numbers on a scale from 1 to 10 than it is to think about numbers on a scale from 0 0.001 to 0 0.01. Just conceptually, 
were more comfortable with numbers in that range. So in order to get densities for a gas that are around one or two, it's common that we take an entire liter's worth of space instead of just a small milliliter. A thousand times more space provides us enough mass to get up to you know one or two grams per liter. So that's why densities use uh, grams per liter generally for gases rather than grams per milliliter. And the, the main reason why the density of gases is so much lower is because the intermolecular attractions are not effective under those conditions to bring the particles close enough together. So it's mostly empty space. 